In this podcast, I'm gonna teach you why do we do slow flight. What is happening, M0 Nation? Jason Schaffer here. Welcome in to the Private Pilot Podcast brought to you by our number one rated online ground school. Check it out, a free two-week trial, m0atrial.com. So by now you've seen the steep turn video this week, I hope, uh, really showing how and why we do steep turns. Today is how and why as a podcast we do slow flight, We'll also talk a little bit as well. Uh, next week's video, something to look forward to, is how to add flaps in during slow flight. And I'll kind of show you three different phases of slow flight. Um, I'll show you babying the flaps in to do dirty slow flight, just dumping the flaps in all at once to do slow flight, and then I'll show you a clean to dirty transition of slow flight as well. So something really to look forward to uh, for next week's video. The focus of this video today though, I wanna focus on why we do slow flight. Because I, it is my belief that in order to excel at these maneuvers, it's one thing to just do them from rote memorization, just my instructor makes me do it, whatever it is, but to understand the why behind these maneuvers, in fact, when I do the CFI podcast later this month, I'll be sharing with my CFI, and you're, by the way, we produce four podcasts. You're welcome to listen to them all, private, instrument, commercial, and CFI podcasts. You can listen to them all, right where you listen to this one, Audible, iTunes, wherever you're listening to it, on YouTube. Um, with the CFI podcast, I'll be talking about really that why and, and how to best teach these maneuvers, and why is a big part of that, and that's the focus here today. So why do we do slow flight? The number one reason is to get better at our landings. Hopefully you follow us on Instagram um, probably now two, three weeks ago. Um, I posted uh, a reel on our Instagram, slow flight down the runway, and how that improves landings so greatly. Go find that and follow us on Instagram as well. Slow flight down the runway. How does slow flight improve our landings? You are flying the airplane, slow flight, sometimes called and was often called back in the olden days, MCA, minimum controllable airspeed. We've since moved away, um, especially with the push of the ACS, we've moved away from using that phrase, minimum controllable airspeed, as much as we used to. But you, right before you touch down, you are in a phase of slow flight, essentially. You are in this phase of slow flight, um, right before touchdown, and it's such a short little time frame. You're only there for three, four, five seconds, depending on the actual transition, into ground effect, and landing. You're only there for a bit. So when we practice it at altitude, it allows us to, hey, these ailerons aren't very effective. Ooh, my rudder's super effective, though. My ailerons aren't very effective. I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude. It allows us these things that you hear your instructor and you hear Jason say so often, it allows these things to really kind of cement in. That's why I like slow flight down the runway because it cements that in. And it also cements in that visual picture because landings are so, so visual. Yeah, there's a lot of finesse and a little bit of hand work and a little bit of footwork, but it's all about the eyes really and where you put those eyes. Great landings have many facets to them. Where you put your eyes is one of them, taking those eyes down that runway. If you, and I don't mean to turn this into a landing podcast, but we could always all use to improve on our landings. Um, if you ever find the ground sneaking up on you, meaning like you hit and you're like, oh, I didn't expect to land so quickly. That's usually because you're looking too close over the cow. Take those eyes down that runway. When I say down the runway, look at the trees at the end of the runway for all I care. Look way, way down that runway. But one of the reasons to do slow fly is to get better at our landings. Another is to gain this full mastery of our aircraft. I want you to learn how the airplane performs at its slowest airspeed, it used to be called the minimum controllable airspeed, and at close to its fastest speed. I really don't want you to push it anywhere near VNE, right? But to operate the aircraft when we practice like an emergency descent, like if our engine's on fire or have a wingtip fire, we need to get down quickly, push it into the yellow arc or to the bridge of the yellow arc to that VNO speed. I'm all about that. I, I don't play around with the VG diagram that much. I don't want you on the, on the wrong side of it, that's for sure. But I want you to learn how your aircraft performs at these various, um, these various speeds. That allows you to gain a better mastery of your aircraft. So if you find yourself shying away from slow flight, I would encourage you to give it another opportunity, give it another chance. Now, I mentioned earlier that slow flight has changed quite a bit. Now, 
If you've been flying uh, for, for any amount of time, you know we recently switched over to the, recently, it's been, it's been six, seven years now, um, switched over to the ACS, Airman Certification Standards. We used to be graded on what was called the PTS, Practical Test Standards. And here is what, um, Here's what the PTS and the ACS, the biggest change was actually slow flight. And here's what the PTS said about slow flight. So this is the olden days, PTS said, the applicant establishes and maintains an airspeed at which any further increase in angle of attack, increase in load factor or reduction in power would result in an immediate stall. So back in the olden days, we used to just do slow flight and we would hang the airplane by the stall warning horn. And the stall warning horn or stall warning tab, whatever the noise is, would be, would be just blaring in the cockpit. We would just hold it, hold it, and basically do everything but don't stall the airplane. When the FAA and the ACS uh, rulemaking committee was working on this, they came to the conclusion, they said, listen, we want students, now called learners as well, we want learners that when they hear the stall warning, when they get any indication, stall warning, buffeting, anything, they do instinctively recover. They were worried, and they had some data to back it up too, not a lot, but it's, it is the right call, although I, I'll tell you in a second what I'm thinking there. It is the right call. They didn't want a bunch of students, a bunch of learners, hanging by the propeller, stall warning, horn blaring, and just getting used to being too letting the stall warning horn come on being normalized. It'd be like if the fire alarm went off in your apartment building or your office building every single day. You eventually, you would ignore, you would ignore that fire alarm, right? They didn't want that to become normalized, right? Uh, a deviation from, from normalization. That's what they, that's what they didn't want. They wanted to become normal. They wanted you to hear the fire alarm and get outside. Hear the stall warning horn, give it some power, push that nose forward. That's what they wanted. So when the, with the advent of the ACS, it came out to read like this. Establish and maintain an airspeed at which any further increase of angle of attack, increase in load factor, or reduction in power would result in a stall warning. Example, airplane buffet or a stall horn. Now we discontinue the slow flight maneuver if the stall warning horn comes on, or if you get that little buffet, that little shake, anything along those lines, any indications that you're on the brink of a stall or close to a stall, you initiate a recovery. That is the biggest change. Now, where I was going earlier, I, I totally support the new slow flight, we'll call it. However, and maybe I'm being a little too romanticizing the past a little bit, and I've been known to do that, so Feel free to comment if you think, hey, Jason, you got you, you to gotta get over it. I still teach both. I like to show my learners, hey, this is slow flight for your check ride. And we learned that one first because it's much easier. And this is how we used to do slow flight back in the olden days. Just so they get a full gamut, a full brink of what that airplane feels like. Because honestly, you've got it in 2-3 Mike Zulu, we would get this thing down to about 55 knots and, and not stall and hold it. But the warning horn comes on around in, in, the, in the low 60s. So we'll get down to maybe 70, maybe 65 if it's not a turbulent day, because on 65 you can catch a little gust and it could trigger the stall warning horn as well. You just don't get as slow and, and that's all fine. But we also teach things like full stall landing. So I think it's important for the learner to know and recognize those symptoms of when that full stall landing is coming for a nice uh, maximum performance short field landing. I believe those things are important. So I'd kind of divide it up and say, this is slow flight for your check, right? ACS, slow flight. And this is how we used to do it back in the olden days, PTS. Again, maybe I'm romanticizing the entire thing, but I believe learners need to learn the full gamut uh, of their aircraft performance, and that's one of the ways. And how I actually do it is, uh, I do a tricky little pattern with my learners, we'll do, and you'll see this um, in next week's video. I have them start in clean slow flight. I have them in clean slow flight transition to dirty slow flight, which sounds, it sounds easier than it is. It's a lot of rudder work, it's a lot of hand work too, moving between adding the throttle, adding flaps, and babying those flaps in. And then I have them from there take it to a power off stall. So clean to dirty to power off stall, right? Which just shows them the full gamut of things in there. And again, it's just 
maximizing the learning opportunity. I, and, and the reason I guess I teach it differently, and I'm on a soapbox and I apologize, I'll go on to my next topic here in a second. Um, I'm not teaching, and this is, this is just the philosophy of M0A, we are not teaching to pass a test. Those of you who are ground school members of ours listening to this, you know this all too well, but some of you don't realize you know, our philosophy at M0A is this philosophy of aviation mastery, and mastery is a quest, not a score on a test. Ground school members know that they're gonna pass their written test, no doubt. In fact, our learners are scoring six, soon to be seven points higher, seven points above the national average across all written exams. Passing check rides, I could not, you know we have that pass your check ride or I'll pay for it guarantee? I could not tell you the last time I, I, I wrote a check for such a thing. It just don't, they don't happen. Why don't they happen? Because we're teaching this real world prep. I could just say, this is your check ride and give you a gouge and say, that's good for your check ride. But I would never in a million years, I don't believe in gouges. I think that's a terrible, terrible idea. I would never prepare you just for the test. I'm preparing you for the real, even our, even our check ride books, everything. It's, don't ever mistake our, our check ride books to be like a gouge or something, because that's not the case. Yes, it's a list of all the questions you could possibly be asked on your check ride, but the questions are not the answers, right? The answers themselves broken into plain real world English to where you, the private pilot, has the ability to explain them. It's one thing to know it. And I, I think that's where people from, especially last month we did mock check ride May and a lot of you shared your concerns. You said, Jason, it's not about knowing it. You're saying, I read some of your comments, you said, I know my stuff, I just don't know how to explain it. How do I articulate what I know to a check ride examiner? And that is a challenging point that I think a lot of people watching this or listening to this right now can relate to. How do you articulate that? That's real world prep. That's the pursuit of mastery. And that's why we do slow flight. That's why we do all of our maneuvers, as a matter of fact. They all have a real world component to them. Why do you do turns around a point? Totally changing subjects now, but still on the topic of why we do certain maneuvers. Why, why do we do that? Why do we do turns around a point? Well, to practice our wind drift, to see how adjusts our bank angle, to hold that constant point all the way around. That's the important thing. That's what we work to do. That's why we do things like turns around a point. Anyways, I'm, I'm off my soapbox for a bit. That's why we do slow flight. You wanna improve your landings? You wanna gain a greater mastery of your aircraft? Do some slow flight, specifically slow flight down the runway. Go find that reel uh, on Instagram from probably three weeks ago, if you're listening to this, as this comes out. If not, you might have to do some searching, uh, but it's out there, I promise. Have just a blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your day, and most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always learning. Have a good one, everybody. I'll see ya.